uh, thank you for being here. I am Bob Hunter. I'm the tools editor. If we haven't met, uh, feel free to look me up anytime during the event and talk. Uh, I love talking tools, and many of you have found me. You know that, so um, I'm glad to do that. But I, I do the tool reviews here for Wood Magazine. I'm in charge of writing all the reviews, and I work with uh, the staff and some and a, and a small core of freelance testers in the area here who test tools for us. I also do some of the testing myself, and we. Uh, you know, we take great pride in, in doing that and keeping our impartiality, and uh, we hope you recognize that. Uh, w but we, uh, we try to put your needs first. So we try to serve the reader with, uh, with all of our reviews. And sometimes that means we step on some toes with some manufacturers, and we just worry about that later. But we, we go ahead and tell you how it is, and we hope you appreciate that. Uh, it's one of the things I enjoy because I get to play with tools all day, and that's, that's a lot of fun except when they put me to the, on the computer, but you know, then it's not too bad. But playing with tools and, and getting to know all this stuff, getting to see new tools coming and, and how they evolve and working with tools, it's just it's a lot of fun getting, getting to do woodworking. So uh, one of my greatest things that I love to do is, is working on router tables. I'm, I'm, I'm a big router table guy. And as you can see with my collection here, uh, this is just half of what I own. So uh, no, I just I have, two, I have two router tables in my shop. but. Uh, uh, I do. I do love using those, and if I can do an operation on the router table, I'll do that prior more than going to the table saw. Just just for the, the the I guess ease of mind of knowing that I'm I'm less likely to be in any kind of a bad situation on the on the router table than I am on a on a table saw. And it's just I've got mine set to my height. So uh, for for those of you guys who are taller like me, you'd prefer it. There's like we'll talk a little bit later about some of those that you can adjust to your height, so I can do work on mine without stooping. And I, I just love working on that. And I do a lot of small boxes and, and stuff that, might, that requires a lot of joinery, and I'll get into some of the jigs and some of that later that I like using that, that work with router tables. So um, just start out, I'll talk a little bit about the tables themselves, about you know, how you go about looking, what you should look for in a table. If you were looking to buy one or if you're looking to upgrade maybe from where you're at or maybe you can just change some of the features. And the good thing about almost all these tables is that you can do this a la carte. You can buy just a fence or just a top or just a plate the insert plate, you can buy a lift, you can buy the stand, you can kind of make your own stuff. You can, you can make everything yourself if you want and then just bolt a router to it. Uh, you know, a, a simple router table can be nothing more than a ply, piece of plywood with a, with a fixed base router or, a, or just a router screwed to the bottom side of it. That's technically a router table. And uh, I've seen some guys, uh, Gary Rogowski, who's a, a, a big well-known furniture maker out in Portland, I, I went out to visit him 12 years or so ago, and his router table is just that. He had a Hitachi plunge router, bolt, you screwed to a piece of plywood, and then just clamped to the workbench. And he said, that's all, and I said, what do you do for a fence? And he pulls out a two by two, clamps it down, said, there you go. <laughs> so it can be as simple as that. Uh, what I like about a lot of today's router tables is that they, they've got a lot of features that really make life easier for you. It can, you can, it can add to your precision, add to your enjoyment of routing. And that so uh, uh, before I do that, do I want to talk a little bit about the, the difference between router tables and shapers? Is there anyone here that owns a shaper? Two. That's about the that's about the normal uh, population we get in a class. That shapers are uh, kind of a they're kind of like the radial arm saw, and that they've in in a lot of ways that they're they're not they're not dying off, but they're not really being they're not gaining in popularity. Uh, you know, the, the the sliding miter saw has replaced the 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 radial arm saw in a lot of shops and such setups, and in a lot of a lot of places now, the uh, router table has replaced the shaper. The reason for that is it's a lot less expensive. You've got a greater selection of cutters, and you can get a lot less expensive cutters, and that and you've got more options available. It's just a, it, you can even get two or three setups sometimes for the price of a shaper. So it's a shaper is a great tool to have if you're doing a lot of the same setup, such as like a raised panel door kind of setup or a dovetail. If you've got a, if you make a lot of drawers or something, then that's great to have. You can be able to do that. But for the most part, the, the shapers just aren't as popular as they were 25, 30 years ago. So um, with a router table, start off here with talking about the tops. Um, you got a, basically about three kinds of tops you can get, at least commercially. If you're making your own, you can make them out of whatever you want. But it, it, commercially, you have pretty much the kind of an MDF core with a laminate cover on it, which is what we've got on the Craig table here and the uh, Rockler down at the end. Then you've got a phenolic table, which is a solid plastic kind of synthetic material that are on the Woodpecker's Jessam and this Rockler table. And 
that's about a three quarter inch thick piece. The, when it's MDF, it tends to be thicker like an inch or so just to get more stability to it. And then if you've got, uh, the other option then is a cast iron table. We've got on the bench dog and Lee Valley, I believe also makes a cast iron top. So this would work, you know, you could buy just the top if you wanted. You can, you can also buy these in cast iron that drop into a table saw. So you can put it in between the, the rip fence rails of your table saw and mount them in there. So there's a lot of good and bad things about each of them and I'll kind of talk through that. The, the MDF tables, uh, the reason they're thicker is because if it's not, they're gonna sag under the weight of the router. So when you put it, the bigger the router in there, the more weight you got and it might make that sag in the middle. You might ask, well, why is that really a problem? It, well, it is if you're doing something that you're running across there and you need to have a perfect height consistently. Like if you were doing uh, raised panel doors, um, you're doing this profile along here, routing that, and if, you're, if your table sags in the middle, what's gonna happen is your board's gonna go across and stay flat, but the, what's gonna happen is the bit is gonna actually sag and it's gonna move down a little bit. So you're not gonna get a perfectly true parallel cut to your board. So that's why it's important to have uh, a top that does not sag. Uh, this Craig table has uh, kind of a strut or a three-sided channel uh, reinforcements under here that, that mount and kind of help hold that and keep it from sagging. I've also seen some that run this way, but some kind of a reinforcement under their metal to keep that from sagging is a big help because the bigger the, the router and then if you add a lift, you're adding a lot more weight in there. You don't want that to sag. The, one, the difference is here, that, or the trade-off is that this is the least expensive top usually when you're getting into an MDF or a particle board kind of top that's been laminate covered. Those are usually your least affordable, you know, your most affordable buy-ins. So they work well, if, as long as you keep them flat, uh, it'll work well. The, the, uh, um, when we move over here to the phenolic tops, they work well because they're thinner they, and it's a more rigid material than, than wood, so it actually will stay pretty flat. Uh, it's a little more of an upcharge for that to get to it, but it holds its shape well and, it, and it'll work with the, any of the lifts and plates. So it's a good trade off for that. The cast iron usually is the most expensive of the, of the two. It's also a lot heavier. Uh, so you, you get that mass of, that dampens vibration, maybe caused by your router or anything. If you've got a big bit on there, it kind of wants to vibrate. That cast iron mass will help take some of that out of there. Um, so that's a good thing to have. The downside with a cast iron top is what? Rust. Anybody ever have cast iron rust? That's a, you gotta keep that treated and fight that. So uh, it does not like moisture. So you gotta keep that good. But uh, we have that on our table saws and our band saws and other tools and joiners, planers. So we've, we're used to doing, dealing with that. If you don't, uh, Bow Shield T9 is the best thing to keep rust off there. If anybody's not ever, know, doesn't know about that and doesn't use it on their cast iron, Bow Shield, B-O-E-S-H-I-E-L-D T9. It's made by the Boeing company, so if you just Google that and find it, it's all over Amazon, places like that sell it. It's the best stuff for, for preventing rust on cast iron, so it works on all, all your tools, hand planes, table saws, anything. Yes, sir? B-O-E, and then shield, S-H-I-E-L-D, and then it's T9 is the kind of the, like the model number. Yes, what, sir? You can, yes. Uh, you can put wax or some kind of a, a slick coat on there. I use Bostic Glide Coat over top of it. So when you put the, the bow shield on, rust, it won't take rust off. No, they make another product that's called Rust Free from Bow Shield uh, that, that'll remove the rust. What do we need? Oh yeah, don't mess with navel jelly. That stuff's a mess. Don't, you don't want that, no. Sorry, I hope we don't have any Navy guys here. So it's not, but it's, uh, it's a mess, don't mess, you know, don't go with that. It's, uh, Rust, Bow Shield Rust Free is a good product, but it does have phosphoric acid in it, so you make sure you wear gloves when you're putting that on because it will eat your fingers up if you don't. But it'll take rust off really quickly, um, and it'll clean up cast iron. It'll leave a shadow behind you. Rust will always have that kind of a darker shadow on your cast iron, but it'll get rid of the rust. So then put that on, but put your Bow Shield on, and then put Bostic Glide Coat over top. We use that on all of our cast iron to just really give a slick surface uh, to really help that. It used to be called Bostic, um, was it dry coat or top top coat? It's what it used to be called. Now they call it glide coat. So it's the same thing. What do you mean? So, okay, the, uh, um, with the tops, the most, some of the most important things here is make sure that you get uh, something with, with at least miter track in there. So you've got a miter slot. 
it's important to have that for putting in some kinds of jigs. You need, you know, you might need a, a joinery jig or something that'll register from that, or uh, you might need. You, you don't really use a miter gauge a lot on the router table, but you know, you'll need something for feather boards that you can register to, to hold stock against the fence. So a miter slot is important, and ideally you can get combo track, which has got a miter slot and T track combined. So a lot of the tables have that. Most of these do. So I think that's that's pretty standard anymore on router tables. Uh, but you can also buy that, and, and if you're making your own top, you can buy this track in aluminum and just route it, route its channel and put it in there. But that's really handy to have for, for jigs and stuff especially. The, the miter gauge is something that I just, I rarely ever use a miter gauge on a, on a, on a router table. But it's, sometimes it happens and, and it's good to have when, when you do. Uh, the next thing is then is an insert plate. It's just a simple, it could be as simple as this. This is a phenolic plate. They also come in aluminum, and some are also in plastic. Avoid the plastic at all costs, because the plastic just doesn't have the weight resistance. It'll sag in the middle. They have the problems we talked about earlier. So you really just want to avoid plastic plates if possible. The phenolic is 3 eighths of an inch thick, generally, to help resist sag, and it works really well. Aluminum typically is a quarter inch, so that they, they both work well at, at holding the router up and not, not uh, sagging. You can mount your fixed base router right to this. You can also mount a plunge base if you wanted. I, I, it's just harder to work with a plunge base. I'll show you that in a little bit, but it's a, a fixed base is really the way to go. All right, um, the, and then with the, with the plates, the other thing is that you get into is there's two different sizes of plates in the world of routing. The standard is, that, well, they're, they're both 11 and 3 quarter inches long. That's, that's a typical, they're both the same length. The difference is most of them are 9 and, three, or nine and 1 quarter inch wide this way. The Rockler and Bench Dog plates are always eight and a quarter wide, so you, you, they won't—they're not compatible. So if you buy, uh, say, a Craig table and, and a Rockler insert, it'll fit, but it's going to leave an inch of open space there. So you don't want to do that. It's also not going to line up with their levelers and all that. So Rockler plates really are made to, admit, to fit Rockler tables, and that way, and the Bench Dog—they're compatible that way. Um, but the Craig, the Jessim, the Woodpeckers, most of the others are all the standard nine and a quarter by 11 and three quarters, and they're interchangeable. So I can take the Woodpeckers lift and put it in the J Craig table. I can put the Craig in the Jessim. I can move them all around. They're compatible. The only difference might be the, the uh, leveling screws that are in the top to level the plate to the, so it's flush with the surface of the, of the top. Sometimes those don't line up necessarily with their, like this one, the, with the Craig table, the levelers are in the table. They're, they're mounted underneath the table so that it just sets on them. And with Jessim and Woodpeckers, their, their leveling screws are in the inserts or in the plates, so in the, or in the lifts in this case. So if you, were put the, if you were to put this into the Craig table, it'll fit, but the leveling won't work out necessarily. You have to kind of figure that out a little bit. So it might, might work, might not. And then also they have screw, screw holes to mount down so that you can secure, like if you wanted to secure the plate to the router table, these don't necessarily line up with each other's tables. So if you, if you want to do that, you, they probably are kind of, they're more made to fit each their specific tables. Um, if you've got a pretty heavy router in there, you really don't need to put the screws into these and hold them down. Your router's not going to, it's not going to jump up at you. Uh, the weight of it usually will hold it down and be, be sufficient. Um, but if you want to, it doesn't hurt anything. What I found a lot of times is then after you level the plate and then you put the screws in and do level it and, and cinch it down, then it changes the leveling. So you sometimes have to come back and redo the leveling after you do that. So in most cases, I just let the plate and the router just hang in those plates. So just put them in and let them go. Um, with the fences then are the next thing. Uh, most of the fences work the same way in that they, they mount in two slots or either on T-track kind of off the sides and then they just, they're independent fences that just move front to back. And they're just kind of, you can wiggle them around and all that. And with a fence, you don't have to, it doesn't have to necessarily be perpendicular to the, or, you know, to the par parallel to the miter slot. Because all you're doing is aligning it usually to the bit and you're setting that. So it can be cockeyed. As long as it's in line with the bit where you want it to cut, you're fine. You don't need to do that. The Craig fence is like a T-square, kind of like a Beesmeyer style fence on a, on a table saw in that it, it, uh, it's a little tight here. So it slides back and forth here, but it, it's in a track on this side, and then on this, on this end it just has a cam lock. So that you engage here with the scale, put it where you want it, 
and then it squares itself. So it keeps itself parallel to the miter slot, and then you can lock it in place down here on this cam. The net result is you get the same thing. It's just, I, you know, that we were saying earlier, I don't know that you ever really need to have this parallel to the miter slot very often. If you're doing something where you've you got your miter gauge up here and you're running a, a thing and you're trying to cope the end of a board, then you could use that maybe, but that's, that's a rarity. Uh, so it's not as critical, but uh, it's one of the things that, that Craig is just unique to them. But uh, all the fences work well. With, with these, just you, you move them forward and back, you can lock them. You want independent faces so that you can move, you can open it up. If you put a bit in there, you want to be able to close these up as much as you can against the fence or against the bit so that you can get your best dust collection and so that your board doesn't drop into that opening. So, if, you know, if you just, if you had your set that wide and you tried routing, there's too much risk of your board catching down in there. So you want to keep those closed up as much as possible. Uh, these are not meant to be sacrificial fences. Although if you do get into the, if you do get the bit into the, they do have a, some kind of a, an, a, a core on there that will do it. So it's an MDF core or it's, in this case, it's phenolic. So the bit can cut into them, but you shouldn't really do that. If you, if you really want a zero clearance effect over your bit, then your best bet is to put some kind of a subfence over top of these because these are, these are going to be kind of hard to replace. You're going to have a lot more work to do. You've got to drill holes and stuff and just, it's just easier to take a, piece of MDF or plywood or something, glue it on there, and then just kind of ease it into your spinning bit and work it into there. That when you do that, anchor one point and then just kind of bring the other one in, and then that'll give you your zero clearance on that to, to do that. But that's, it's not very often that you really need zero clearance on a router bit, uh, but you can do that. That's the beauty of the, the fences here. So, and with these, you can also offset the fences. So if you wanted to do a jointing effect where one, for, where your one fence is proud of the other, so if you were doing just like the effect of a jointer, you could raise your in-feed table, or your out-feed table, sorry, you could, you could raise that a little bit and move it out so that when you remove, say, a 32nd of an inch, you could put a 32nd of an inch shim over here, and then when you've removed that, it fits perfectly up against that fence. Otherwise, if you do that, if you don't do that, and you take that 32nd off, then you've got a kind of a cam action that's gonna, when it gets to a tipping point, it's gonna go back over here, and you're gonna get an uneven cut. It'd be like snipe on a jointer. Yes, sir. It's uh, uh, most of these that have them. The better the, the better quality fences usually have those in them. Uh, they come with, equipped with. Let's see if I've got any here. Uh, here's the Craig. They come with just a couple little plastic. Um, they're about maybe eighth inch rod, I guess, like that little uh, things. And then they go in behind. You would take the fence face off, put it into the end. There's there's little grooves on the back side. Put these in and then put that fence face back. Actually, and then, and then it would make that stand out just that little bit. So the Jessim table, the woodpeckers, they all come with it. I believe the bench dog does. I can't remember if it comes with I was thinking it might. I know you can buy them aftermarket. You could also make um, any kind of a wood shim and stick in there. Um, it just, it's just a slot in the back, a little rectangular groove you could put in there. So just cut a little rectangular piece if you want and put it in there. If you don't want to do that, you can also just attach a piece of laminate to the outfeed fence. I guess in this case over here, um, just a piece of whatever thick laminate, you know, whatever equals the whatever, however much you're removing, you can do that. Just, but you need to have that so that your your outfeed fence is equal to the board after you've removed the amount that you're cutting away. But some of these just come with that. That's a nice feature to get if you do it. It just saves you the trouble of, of having to keep laminate around. Um, but they do, most of them do that. Uh, they almost, most of them have, will have T-Track on there. That's an important feature because you want to be able to use accessories like, like feather boards on the front, or in this case, fence stops. There's a, there's a track on top. Fence stops that will come, come on here. Those will be, if you were routing some kind of a stopped channel or, or whatever you're doing. Um, let's say you were doing a, uh, you wanted to route a stopped groove from one end. Um, say you made a, let's see, here's an example of where I did one. So I've got a dovetail, a through dovetail box with a captured bottom in it. And I made a stopped groove in there to hold that, that. And what I did was just by setting the stops at each end and then had a quarter inch spiral bit. And then I would just take my boards and put them up against the fence, lower it onto the spinning bit. Cause it's only, you're only talking like a quarter, 16, maybe three sixteenths of an inch tall, lower it onto there and then go to this side, hit the stop and then go back that way, hit the stop, lift it up and there's your stopped groove. 
So that's the beauty of stops. Uh, some of these, most of these are sold as accessories. You won't get those usually with a, with a fence, but they're really handy to have. Uh, you can also make your own. Any, any little T-bolt or a hex bolt will also work in T-track. You can just make your own out of some right, just make a right-angled piece of wood, something that would flip down, and you can make stops, but that's a handy little thing to have. So make sure you get those. Fences also have dust collection built into them. Most of them are made for two and a half inch uh, typical shop vacuum hose. So you're better off to do that to with an actual shop vacuum system rather than taking your, your four inch uh, piece of flex hose from your dust collector and necking that down to two and a half. You just don't get the performance out of that that you will out of a shop vacuum. So if you're, if you're trying to c capture all the dust from here, really work with a shop vacuum hose, uh, whether it's any kind of whether doesn't, it could be as simple as a plain old shop vac or a craftsman vac, or, or you could even be as high end as a fine or festool, one of those tool triggered vacs. Anything that's going to be able to fit that well and, and get suction directly to it, it helps. Now, when you're routing something that the fence is not going to be able to, your chips are not going to come into the fence. Let's say you're routing a, a groove on a board over here and, the, and all the debris is going down the bottom. So then all that's going to go either into your router or the router, the, the vents on the router, the air stream is going to just spew it everywhere. So you can also, you can do a couple of things there. You can build a shroud around there to, and then put a housing with a dust collection port on there to try to capture that dust. Uh, or you can buy those. Uh, Bench Dog and Ankara both sell these little housings. And if you can see inside, I don't know, Paul, can you see inside that at all? Maybe I can turn that a little bit. But there's a housing that goes around the router that encloses it. There we go. And that just gives you a little bit better dust collection uh, capability in there so that you can collect off the back. In this case, it has a four inch port, but something that helps you to keep that dust in there. And the airstream, if you're pulling air out, you have to be able to get air in, which not only keeps the air moving, keeps your dust, your, your chips and stuff getting out, but it also helps keep your router cooled. So you don't want to, the last thing you want to do is put your router in a box and then seal it up so tight that it can't get air and it gets hot. You don't need that because you're not going to get dust collection and you're going to burn your router up. So, but those are, those are vented for that particular reason. Uh, INCRA, there's an INCRA table down here. I'll tell them more about that later, but that's also got a, a little shroud around it um, that we can talk about. And that, that helps to really corral the dust. And that one does it really effectively. I'll, I'll get to that in a little while. Let's see. With the stands, then, these all just pretty much, with the exception of the, the bench dog, they're just an open leg stand made of either tube steel or, or, or uh, angle steel. Really nothing fancy to them, but they're, they're nice if you can get them. You can, you know, nothing says you have to do this. You can build your own cabinet. In fact, we have plans on Wood Magazine. We've done a number of router cabinets and stands over the years. So you can build anything as simple as, you know, you can build one out of two by fours and attach your top to it. You can build one out of nice plywood. You can, you can put it, made it out of all kinds of, you know, curly maple if you want. Anything you want just has to hold the router up, hold the stand up, and get it to the height that you want. Uh, the nice thing about these, these kind of stands is they either have leveling legs, which, which will level it to your floor and get it so that you're not rocking, or they'll have casters, which some of these do, the rocklers I think here have casters on them, and that lets you keep it portable and move it around. Make sure that if you do that, you make sure that you got locking casters on all four of them so that you can lock that in place because a router table will want to move sometimes on you as you're, as you're routing. So get that good and locked in. Some of them like the Incra and the Woodpeckers have casters on one end, like a two casters up here, and then a kick, kickstand caster on this with some leveling feet. Those work pretty well on very, very smooth floors. But if you have any rough floors at all, those don't really work well. So if you have to move it a lot, like, you know, that's, that's not necessarily a good option. But you could do that on any stand. Um, you can put it uh, on a cabinet stand if you want. The Craig stand, one, one of the things that's unique about it that I really like is that it's got a lot of holes pre-drilled in it to, so that you can do different heights. And as I said earlier, I'm, I'm a lot taller, so I like mine tall. This one's set pretty low, but you can take and just by just repositioning where those bolts are at, you can raise that thing up. And I've got mine at home, and then I have it on casters rather than this because I have a Craig table. And it's about, I want to say about that tall for me. So it's perfect for me that I don't have to stoop over. So this one gives you a lot of flexibility in that, than being able to do that. And if you, if you like the Craig stand and you say, oh, I like it, but I'd really rather have the Jess Sam or the Woodpeckers, again, like we talked earlier, these are, this is a la carte. You can buy their top and fence and all that, put it on a Craig stand, and it'll all work out. You, can just, you might have to do some of the drilling yourself to Mitch, because this, this top is pre-drilled to fit this stand, 
but you can certainly drill it and, and screw it yourself on there. That's not a problem. We're, we're all ingenious woodworkers, right? We can figure those things out. So, or you can make your own stand and then raise it up and however you like. <clears throat> In my first class this morning, I ate a lot of dust. So that didn't set well with my burger very good. The, uh, when, you're, when you're working with a stand, the, ma the main thing you want to keep is access to the router is critical because you, you've got to get in there to either change bits or to, or to turn it on or off or whatever. So keep your, keep your options open on the router. So if you, if you do enclose it in a cabinet, make sure you can get to it. So if you don't have, say, a router lift where you can bring it up and change bits on top, if you've got to bring it out, then you've got to be able to get into it from underneath. Or if you have it just, just, onto the, just secured to the plate, And you could just lift it, you could just lift the router and plate up and you could change bits, put it all back down in there like that, and you can be good to go. The thing with the routers is that the, with these, a lot of them, you've got to be able to get to your, your power switch and your uh, variable speed dial. And somebody says, why would I want a variable speed router? Well, yeah, you, you, you always want a variable speed router for a router table. To have a single speed router is just asking for all kinds of trouble because you're, you adjust the speed to the diameter of your bit. So if you were running, uh, say, a one-inch uh, bit of some sort and you're just plowing a groove, well, that's fine. You can run that at high speed at 25,000 or so. That's great. But if you're doing a three-and-a-half-inch panel razor, you don't want to run that at that speed. It's going to be like a helicopter there ready to take off, and it'll scare you to death. So uh, just, yeah, I wouldn't advise that. So uh, you want to slow those down to the slowest speed you can get on your router, typically around 10, 12,000. If you can go even slower than that, it's great. So somewhere in that neighborhood, you can vary a little bit within that, just based on your wood species. But you kind of really want to make sure you get that speed. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's exactly it. Good. You support a point that I've been making for years with the tool companies, and they don't listen to me very well. So maybe they'll listen to you. So it's a good point. So with this is a Porter Cable 890. You probably have the 690 then if you're getting them with the numbers. But or maybe yeah. So what when you look on their dial, and it's got the the actual RPM markings. So it gives you an idea. And it it may not have them every single one, but it's got enough range that you can say, okay, there's 16,000, there's 23,000. So you can kind of if you're looking for 20, you can kind of gauge about where you are in the middle there. So it gives you the actual RPM ratings. That's a great thing to have. If you look on the Bosch router, I'm on three. So what, what's three? You know, is, there's one. Is, that, is one high or is that low? So you, know, you end up going one to six, and you don't know what that is. So you look, and you're like, well, where's the, where's the information? Where does it tell me what, what's one to six mean? It doesn't tell you anywhere. It tells you in the manual. So you can get your manual out and look at it. And then, you know, or if you'll just do like probably most people, you'll, you'll get it under the router and you'll sit there and you'll kind of turn it like that. Oh, that, that sounds about right. That's, that's kind of how sometimes you end up doing that. So that is a, 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 a critical point there. Uh, the Milwaukee router and a, and a couple of others have the same kind of things where their dial is numbered one to six. But right beside there, they've got a chart then that tells you what one is, the, the speed range of what one means and what six means and that. So it's equated. So it's right there. Now, if that's upside down in a router table, you know, you've kind of got to look and study it a little bit and see, is that right? You know, kinda, so you get the feel for it. Generally, the higher the number, the higher the RPM. So it's, I've been after them a little bit. It seems like a simple change to make, but they probably made like a million of these speed dials, and they just don't want to go back and change them. So, and the Porter Cable 7518, the big three-horse router that a lot of people use in their, in their router tables, it has five speeds on it. So it's not variable, but it just has five speeds. It has a slide switch here, and the speed ratings are written up here in actual RPMs. But when you're on a router table like that, and you're wanting to adjust speed, and you look down there, and you're like, there's the switch. OK. There again, you have to get down on your knees and look up underneath to see the numbers again. So you're kind of, again, going, well, that sounds right. There's the high. There's the low. And until you get used to it, you kind of do that. So it's a little guesswork. Not real precise. I wish they would change that. 
But yeah, that's one of the things. Make sure you can get to those controls because you really need to be able to control the speed to adjust it to the bit size that you're using. Um, that's really, really critical. And um, the other thing then is if you're going to put there to avoid having to reach the power switch all the time is to add an auxiliary switch to the table. I'm a big fan of these. This is just, I don't know, 25 bucks or something for one of these switches. You can get them, Rockler, Woodcraft, a lot of places sell those. It's just a secondary switch. You plug your router into this box, and then you plug that box into your outlet, turn your router switch on, and then every time, then you control it from here. So it's a lot handier, easier to reach. You don't have to reach down under and kind of fumble in the dark looking for where's, where's my power switch on there, and that, and especially hard on plunge routers because they're on the handles and they're harder to find sometimes. So definitely look for an auxiliary switch. Just anything to mount it and get it on there makes life a lot easier for you. And if you can do this, you know, if you can get it hooked up to a shop vacuum that has a, a tool triggered aspect, then you can, when you turn that on, it triggers both your vacuum and your router. So you can tie all that together and you don't have to worry about turning the router on and off. So those are both handy things to make sure you do when you're considering your stand options. One of the other things to think of is a bench top router table. So I'll just hold on to this. But this basically is just, just a miniaturized version. Uh, a lot of people start out with a bench top router table. They're, they're easy to do. You can put a small router in there. You can put a big router in there, I guess, too. It's just you don't have as much workpiece support. Your fence is a little smaller. But they work great. They do the same functions. Uh, they're really handy to do. They're, easy. they're lightweight. You can lift them up and off. Table, put them under your bench. Uh, really worth getting. And if you uh, have any need, maybe for a second router, it's, it's handy to have two router setups sometimes. If you're doing uh, you know, rail, style, rail and style doors, if you want that where you're doing the, you can set up to do the stick cut on your main table, you can do your cope cut over here, you can do vice versa, you can put your panel razor over here, you can do both the profiles on this, and not have to keep them going back and forth. If you're doing through dovetails, same thing. You could do the, the tails on one with the dovetail bit, you could do the, the pins on here with the straight bit. So it's kind of nice, then you can go back and forth and tell which way to go and how you're, until you get that fit just right. Because you hate to go and make, get the cut on one just right and then find out later you have to go back and set it up again. So, you know, for, um, I can't remember what these cost. I want to say it's maybe 150, 200 bucks for one of these smaller ones. Uh, it's a nice little, just something else to add if you want a second router. Or if you just have a small shop, it's a good option to, to pick up something like this. And there are a number of, Small routers in you know on the market bench top bench dog Bosch skill I don't know there's a number of them out there so all those work pretty pretty well uh, but you want get one that has at least some mass to it uh, the problem with the aluminum top the ones that are really lightweight is that they just they want to scoot on you and so you've got to get them mounted down to something so you want to get something with a little bit of mass to avoid all that vibration transferring in through the from the router to the table so really get into that. <clears throat> Okay, then they, uh, let's talk about the, the motors a little bit, uh, and then I'll get into the router lifts because you've got to have a motor for the lift. The, we've got pretty much all the router motors here, the routers that come with the, where the motor can lift out of the base. The only one I don't have is the big Milwaukee three-horse motor. Uh, I had one here, but I think John Olson from our staff swiped it, and he's hiding it somewhere around the building. I don't know. He likes it. So uh, we do have several of these. The... There's two three-horse motors out there, through the, this, the Milwaukee and then this Porter Cable 7518. They both have the three, three to three and a half horsepower rating, whatever you want to believe. It's, you know, they're kind of um, somewhere in that neighborhood. That's really nice if you can get it. You know, that's a little pricey. They're both about 300, 350 to, to, to buy one of these alone. Uh, but that's nice if you're doing panels, you know, big panel raising bits and stuff, be able to take, you can take a bigger bite off with those because they've got the muscle to do it. But that said, you don't have to have one of these routers to do that. Any, any of these routers here will work, will work fine in a table, and they will spin even a panel raising bit. You just have to take smaller cut, increment cuts with them. You try to take a big, you know, a quarter inch cut at a time with one of those bits, and it's going to make your router stall, and you don't want to do that. So just, you can take it easy with them, but they all have the ability to do that. So you make sure you get one that's got, and all these do have, a half inch collet. So you want half inch and quarter inch, but, but, to, but for the bigger bits, you've got to have half inch shank uh, bits. So 
stick with that. But most of these will fit in a, in a lift and everything. They'll also fit by themselves. You can just take, mount them onto your, any kind of a top onto, or a plate, either one. You generally have to take the sub base off. That's the plastic base. Take that off and then drill the holes and mount it. You might have to get longer screws because a lot of times these screws aren't made to go through something else and get on there. So you might have to go to the hardware store and make sure you get those screws lined up. And some of these are metric, so you want to get that, like the Bosch screws I know, I think the Makitas are metric screws when you go looking for that. So, um, but that helps to get those mounted onto a plate or onto a table. But you do have to take this off to do it. Um, it just gives you then, if you leave it on there, that just leaves, you're just basically giving up that much room of, tr of bit travel. So take that off and get rid of it. Uh, but you can take them out of their bases, you can do that, you can put them on. Some of these actually have lifts built into their bases. The Bosch, the Porter Cable, and the Milwaukee, I believe, are the ones who do that. And I can... Triton's a plunge router, and I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different animal, but it does have some of that. I want to show you this here real quick on the fixed base. So here I've got a Milwaukee router mounted in just on a Porter Cable base. Got it in its own base, and it has, we drilled a hole through here to put this wrench that comes with it so that I can put that through there. I have to release the, the lock, the, the base lock, and then I can raise and lower the bit. And see if I can do this here, because it's, I've got to drop the cord through. So then you put your wrench through there, and sometimes you have to kind of fumble around until you feel it engage. And then you can just, by twisting that around, you can raise that up. Some of these, you, you can't quite get the bit, or the, the collet all the way above the table so that you can't maybe change bits from above. Uh, some of them you can, it's a little bit tricky, but, but it does work well enough. It's, it's, it's a pretty decent system for, for setting bit height. So it's, a, it's all right, you can do. So you can take your router out, put the bit in, and then use this to kind of fine tune that height. Yes, sir, in the back. Yes, yep. Yes, and that's what I say, it will, yeah, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that, but you're right, Triton does have one. Um, but with a fixed base, these are, there's a, a few that have that. Porter, uh, the, the Milwaukee and the Bosch combo kits come with this wrench. The Porter cable does not. You have to buy their wrench separate, but you can do it. And it does work all right. You still have to reach down below, though, to engage the base lock. So it is kind of, it's kind of a compromise there between a full lift and a, and a non-lift. Um, the plunge, right, you can with, yes, the Porter cable you can with, with their optional wrench because it has a little spur here that you can put the, bait, the tool through there. It'll engage that and it will unlock it and it will adjust it. So you can do both. It's got second, you have to drill a hole over here for the base lock and you have to drill a hole for the, the adjuster. So you can do that. Uh, the, the router table that we use in the Wood Magazine photo studio down here normally uh, has, we have this set up in there. So, and it works, works pretty well. So in the plunge router world, there's, there's not many dedicated plunge routers left anymore. They're, most of them are being discontinued by their companies. Uh, the Triton is, like we talked about, has, they've got three different plunge routers. One is really too small for a router table, but there are other two. They have a two horse and a three horse model equivalent. They have so many watts, I don't remember what the number is, but it's, it's equivalent to a two and a three horse. Uh, but you can put those in a, on a plate and mount them in a router table, and they do have a lift uh, wrench that comes with it, and you can work, you can put that in there. And it is a pretty good system for a router, for a router table to work in there for a plunge. You can bring the, the collet fully above the table to change bits, and, and it'll work fine. It's, it's still not quite as good as a dedicated router lift, but it's pretty good. Uh, the, the problem with the Triton routers is that they're not really that great for handheld routing. They're kind of a, they're kind of a clunky, awkward mechanism for doing that. They work really well it, once you get the height set and that they have terrific power and that it's just until you get used to one, it's kind of an awkward situation. So that's, I'm not, you know, I, I'm trying to think it just takes some getting used to. It's kind of like, uh, you know, doing anything that's opposite of what you're normally used to. So it's just, it uh, takes a little, little time, but, but they, they do make terrific router, t router table routers. Yeah, most of the plunge, the dedicated plunge routers are going, going away. Uh, I've got a Bosch uh, 1619 here. That's their three horse motor. That's been discontinued about a year ago. Uh, they're no longer making these. You can probably still find them at retail, but they're going away. 
just they're just not selling. I think the combo kits are really getting popular, and a lot of the small routers are, are really coming back into vogue, which this was something that was popular in, the, in a long time ago, and now they're coming back. They went away, they're coming back again. So the one and a quarter, the one horse, one and a quarter horse routers are really coming back into vogue, and people are buying a lot of those. So the, the three horse routers just aren't selling as well, so companies are just doing away with them. Uh, DeWalt did away with theirs. They, have a, they had two, they had a 621 and a 625 router. Those are both discontinued. The combo kits are still around, and you can buy the, the plunge router it's of that version. So like if you were buying the Bosch, we want to buy a Bosch two and a quarter horse plunge router, you're getting this motor in the plunge kit. You can buy just that in the plunge base, or you can buy the both. The, you can buy either the fixed base or the plunge, or you can buy the combo kit, but it's the same router in that case. But a dedicated plunge router is just kind of, I mean, I think right now Triton might be the only one left on the market. No, I take it back. Makita has a little one-horse router that's a dedicated plunger. The rest of them are just going away. The Freud, they had a really nice three-horse router that they did away with. Um, they're just not selling enough of them anymore. And I, I think that maybe the, the, the router lift, the evolution of router lifts has probably caused some of that because it's, it's helped to for, spur the development of, you know, and the popularity of the combo kits and the, and the motors that come out of the bases. So I think that's probably been, been the biggest part of it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this Bosch, but even though it's, you know, it's going away, but you can, like I said, you can probably still find them if you can get them used. I mean, they're just, they're great routers. Uh, the problem with plunge routers in, in most cases in a, in a base is that you're always fighting that, that spring. You're fighting that when, you, when it's upside down and you're trying to set the bit height, that spring kind of works against you and makes it difficult. So in a lot of cases, what you have to do is open it up and take the springs out and, and then you can get it without having to fight that. The, this Bosch, what it does, it has a spring bypass so that you can collapse it down, compress that spring, and lock it out, and then you can use it just a free-handing router then, or as a free drop router that way. So it doesn't, you don't have to fight the spring. But if you want to go back to using it, you get it out and you just undo it, and the spring is right there. So that's just one of the, it was one of the nice features about this. Um, but again, that's for a limited time, I would say. <laughs> but that's, that was the only one that had that feature. And now that I say, I just thought of another, Hitachi still makes their, their plunge router. They have a big three horse plunge router that they still make. It's the KM12 or something, no, something like it. It's a big KM12 VC, maybe something like that. It's a big three horse. They do have it, but with that one, you have to take the spring out really to, to use it effectively in a router table. It just gets really difficult because it has a very stiff spring and it, it's just really difficult to use in a router sit table situation. <clears throat> Right, when you do that with a, with a Triton, you're able to bypass it because of the same thing. That's, that's a nice feature to have when it, when it does that. Um, yeah, the Triton is, it, it works effectively. So, yeah, for the table. Do you like using it handheld? I don't. Yeah. Yeah, you bought it just for the table. And that's what a lot of people do when they get those, yeah. So, uh, but you can do that. But, you know, when you're buying a Triton router at 350 bucks, you're still, you're, you're right in that neighborhood of a lot of others. So. You know, it's, you're putting in a pretty big investment. Um, let me talk a little bit about router lifts, because when you, can, when you can get a lift that you can put a motor in so that you can take the motor out and, and put it into a lift. Let's just say this just M for instance. So you, with, a, with a router lift like this, you just take the motor and put it into the lift, and then that becomes part of it. You lock that in, and then you control the height from above, with a, in this case with a speed wrench. You just move it up and down, and then it becomes in there and it's locked in. Um, I'm a big fan of router lifts. I, I just, I really like the, the ability that they have to, to they, you just, I just don't think you can get consistently as accurate with the fine tuning precision with any other mechanism out there. Uh, you can certainly you can certainly get there eventually. This will get you there quicker. With you put the wrench in and just by turning and just a little bit, you can able to get that that fine tuning because they have such fine lead screws. You can do that. Uh, they're just such a height uh, a big advantage to be able to get precise routing situations set up, and and then be able to get repeatable setups because you've got uh, gauges on here to tell you 
where you were at if you need to go, and it's got a lock to, to lock that spindle so it won't go in, and everything happens above the table in those cases. So with all the lifts, uh, we've got the Jessim lift, we've got woodpeckers, we've got a number of these that, that all work basically the same, that they, they have a carriage that you're riding, the motor rides in and brings it up and down. But with these, you have to, some of them, the routers won't fit in some of the lifts. This is the Jessim mast, master lift. It's called Mast R lift when, they, when you see it on the sign, but they call it just the master lift. This one will fit every router motor out of the box. So if you, doesn't matter what router you have, router motor, it's got a built-in adapters ready to go so that you just change these, the position of these uh, little socket screws and then that changes the positions of these, these kind of calls that, that clamp against there. And that'll, it'll fit all the routers. It comes standard that way. That's one of the nicest things about it. So that it, you don't have to know which router you've got. So if you, if you buy the lift first, you can then pick any router. Or if you have a router, you just go and buy that and uh, they'll, they'll work all together. The, um, where is it? GSM's other lift, this is called the router lift, router lift. And it'll fit the same thing. It'll fit the th most of the, the three and a half inch diameter routers, which is most of this size, like the Bosch, the Milwaukee, the Porter Cable, the DeWalt, Craftsman, most of those sizes will fit that. Uh, but you have to, and, and if you want a different size of those, you specify it when you're buying. So if you want a three, the, the, the big three horse router motor, you specify that size. So they always go by the diameter of the motor when they measure that. And so you specify and it'll come and it'll only fit that one when you buy it. So you have to just make that case. With uh, some of these like woodpeckers and bench dog in general, the Excalibur lift, you specify which router size you want and then they send you the adapters that fit in here and then that will fit your motor. So if you have this set of adapters and then you decide to change routers, it doesn't, if it doesn't fit, you gotta get another set of adapters. But that's the, the thing. But once you get those, it'll fit perfectly and as long as you keep your router, it'll work great in there and it'll always fit. Theoretically, the router lift should never really go bad. So, I mean, there's, um, so your router motor might go bad, but your, your lift really shouldn't because it's just a simple carriage up and down. So you can fit that in. Yes, sir, what, what can I do for you? The same rule supply, uh, applies there. So the, the, the Rockler and the Bench Dog are, they're, they're still the eight and a quarter by 11 and three quarters, and everybody else is nine and a quarter by 11 and three quarters. I don't know if they are. I'm trying to think of anybody that really is. Um, everybody that has a lift that I think has, also has a table, um, but, they, but they most make to the same specs, so, so that you can swap them out the same as you could the insert plates, so the lifts can. Um, Excalibur is a company that's owned by General International, so this is their kind of accessory line. So they make a, a, a router lift that'll fit. It's the same size, so it'll fit the Jessim and the Woodpeckers and all that. But they also make a table as well. Theirs is a little bit different design from others in that it has a four-post lead screw with a chain drive, and then the, the, you'd have to have adapters to fit your router motor so that when you turn this one, it, that chain spins around and then it makes the the carriage go up or down. The only thing there that worries us is that long term is with this, the chain picking up dust and, and then what we do. So you're going to have to keep that chain cleaned if you've got one of these and then put a dry lubricant on it. Something you don't want to use an oil lubricant like WD-40 or something. You want to put something that's going to go on and then dry quickly so it won't attract dust and help build, help build up on air because that's only going to clog up everything. Um, and then this one does have adjustments for if the chain starts to stretch a little bit, you can tighten up the tension on the chain. So it's a really good lift, uh, works really well. This is the bench dog lift and it's incredibly heavy. It's solid cast iron. <laughs> this whole collar down here is cast iron. The top is, is heavy steel and it, it weighs, it must weigh 15 pounds. It's just a really heavy monster. Um, it works okay. It's not, not great, but it works okay. It comes with an Acme, Acme thread lead screw, so it's an 8, TP, or, yeah, 8 TPI, 8 threads per inch, and so it's, it's really good at making coarse adjustments. So if you're trying to raise your carriage up, raise the lift to change the bits, it works that quickly. You put this, the wrench in up here, and then you turn it to make the, it'll, it'll bring it up and down, but it's not as good for setting fine adjustments. And the 
it just kind of a thing. It does have a lock on there so that once you get it set, you can lock it and know that it's going to stay safe. And that extra mass really helps to dampen the vibration. Um, but Rockler is working on redeveloping this. So this is going to be obsolete soon. They're going to replace it with a better model, hopefully. Um, when we reviewed router lifts a year ago, they took some of our, uh, our uh, criticisms to heart. And uh, they've told me that they're putting those <laughs> into application. So hopefully we'll see what they do with it. Um, but it's, uh, it's made to go in a heavy table. That's part of the, the, I guess, the legacy here of the cast iron top and the cast iron heavy lift. But that's a lot of weight. You would not want to put this into an MDF top because that extra weight in a three horse router and you're going you're gonna to pull that thing down. So this, this is the MLCS lift. And it's a little bit different in that it it has the same lead screw, but the adjuster goes, works beneath the table and goes out the side so that you reach down at the side of the table to adjust it. And it has a geared mechanism right up here that has, and it, it would be different if I had this installed on a table, but it kind of installs like this and it, and it screws onto the underneath side of your table so that it would set like this, extend out, and then you would take your wrench and put that in and then you would turn it over here to make your, your vertical adjustments. Um, it's a little, little clunky, um, but it works. Um, there's better options out there, but this, this one will work. So, to get the bit out, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's got some issues with it, but it, it's only made to accept the three horse motors. So it'll take the Porter Cable 7518 and the Bosch 5625 the big three horse motors. That's just, it's just made for those specifically. And then here's another idea on a router lift. This is from the people at Dowlmax. So if you've heard of their Dowlmax Dowling jig, this is their router lift, which I, seems like two completely different products that they carry, <laughs> but they do. And folks here in the back corner, if you can't see, you feel free to stand up and move around or come up here, but um, this is their router lift in that it's a, basically a couple of hinged uh, phenolic plates with a, gas, a couple of gas struts here that raise and lower. It's, a, it's really a tilt. They, they call it router lift, but I, I told them they should have called it the router tilt. But it, so it basically it lifts it up. It gives you good access to your router so that you can change bits and adjust heights. And if you've got a, one like this Makita, then you can change your bit and move that up and down. One of the downsides to the Makita and the Hitachi, and I think the Porter Cable 690, is that they spin in their bases to adjust the heights like this. So that as you do that, you're turning your variable speed dial maybe away from you. So you don't know where that's going to be, but that's the choice you have to make based on your bit height. So when you set the bit, you're locked into that, and then you lower it back down. And now maybe your, your variable speed is maybe back here. So that's just kind of the luck of the draw with those but that's a, that's a lift. This system is basically just that hinge plate with the struts is all they sell. So you take your top, your stand, your fence, and you just add those between them. So basically it's just a, just a hinged plate system you put between your top and your stand, and then it just opens it up for you. That's all it does. So this is, this is a Rockler stand and Rockler top with that Dowlmax lift mechanism in there. So it's another way of doing that. Any questions so far on any of this? How, how, sorry? You mean what order did we rank them or how did, what kind of specs did we? Yeah. Well, when we, we did this a year ago with, um, with some of our testers, we, we did all these lifts that are here and the, uh, the Jessim master lift came out on top, uh, not only because it accepts all the routers right away without any need for additional adapters, but because it had the best system of raising and lowering it had the best spindle lock. It had a lot of the other features that were really good. It had no backlash in the, in the, in the, the uh, uh, lead screw. Backlash, in case you don't know, that means when you're, when you're changing directions and if you go back the other way and if there's a, like a little bit of time, a bit of movement before it engages, that's called backlash. So ideally it should engage as soon as you go backwards, it should engage right away. And this had the least amount of that. So it was a really tight, really well-made lift. Um, I'll get to you in a second here. I'll just kind of go through the rest of them. Uh, the second best router lift in our test then was the other Jess M. We actually liked it better. 
it, it sells for about 175 or so dollars, I think, and it was actually our best value as well, but it was our second favorite overall. We really liked these two much better, I, I, and if I remember right, then the Woodpeckers, I think, was our next favorite lift. Um, it's a little bit different in that it has a 32 TPI lead screw, so it's a really fine lead screw for making fine adjustments. So you've got this built-in wheel, thumb wheel here, to make those ultra-fine adjustments, but you don't want to raise the whole thing up and do that to raise, it'll take forever to bring the carriage up to be able to change bits. So it gives you this spring-loaded wrench that you put down in there and you can <coughs> twist it, bypass, and then you can bring the whole thing and make a coarse movement all the way up, release that. So then when you go to set your height, you just kind of get it close and then start using the thumb wheel then to get it, get it really finely adjusted. Um, so these three were our favorites. Then probably I think it was the Excalibur was our next favorite. And uh, this Rockler lift actually was really good too. This is the Rockler Router Lift FX. And it's, uh, it's actually made by Rockler to Jessim spec. So they, they licensed the technology and the design from Jessim because they used to, Jessim used to have this lift in their line. They've since eliminated it, but Rockler picked it up and now they carry it. So they design it, but it's a really nice setup lift, um, really pretty well made. And it will fit all the three and a half di inch diameter motors. So that includes the bulk of the mid-sized two and a quarter motors. Uh, and it also has one feature in that it's got a release, a cam lock release, so that if you want to take your motor out to use for handheld use, you can just open that up, pull your motor out, and you're good to go. With the others, you have to do, loosen some screws and bolts and things to get them out. This one's the easiest in and out. That's a really good lift. And uh, see, I'm sorry, the gentleman. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. This one you can because it's made to Rockler specs. So it's made to fit the Rockler size. So it's an eight. This is the Rockler table here and it'll fit right in it. Um, it's made to fit their bench top. Okay, I guess I don't know about that. It's, I just have the Craig and it won't fit there because the Craig is made to a different size. But it'll fit this one, I know that. It's made to the same specs as the Rockler's uh, plates. It, if it doesn't fit a certain plate, I guess I don't know, I can't speak to that, but it, it's made to the same. So it's the eight and a quarter by 11 and three quarter. Uh, but if you, well, I, I guess you could always make another top or, or get a different lift, I suppose. Yeah, you're, I mean, you got, it sounds like if it won't fit, you're, you're kind of stuck there without, I guess, uh, but that's an, it's a key thing to know before you buy one or the, you know, is to, is to know which, so, yeah. You might talk to Rockler then and see what they'll tell you. So, the, sir, back there, you had a question earlier. Jessem is J-E-S-S-E-M. It's uh, that's just their name. The family, it's a family-run business out of, uh, I think it's London, Ontario. Um, it's, made, it's run by the, the, the man who invented the router lift, basically. Darren Smith, the president of their company, the owner of it, he's the guy that invented the first router lift back in 1988, something right in there. And he's still doing it to this day. So they really do those well. So, no, they do not. The second, the, the, the lesser priced one, the router lift, it does not accept all the motors out, out of the box. You have to specify when you're ordering what one you fit, and it will only fit the ones that you specify. So it's, if you say, I have a three and a half inch diameter, it'll fit all the three and a half inch. If you have the Makita, for example, is like a three and a quarter inch motor. If you specify that, it'll fit only that Makita because they make this collar to that specific size. And I don't believe this one will, f I don't think they make it to fit the larger three, the three horsepower motors. I don't believe it does. I'd have to check the, remember my math on that, but. This one's about half price of the, of the upper lift. So around 175 and 350 for these. So, yeah, I mean, really, honestly, that's what I tell people. This is the one to get because it's the, it's the, least, the, the least expensive and it's really, really good. It doesn't have a couple of features on that one, but it's really good. And you can use, you can use a, a, a nice Porter cable or Bosch router in it and you'll get along fine. So I would say, yes, yeah, save, save your money, you know, in my,
Uh, boy, in a store situation, I don't know where you're going to find them. Um, I know that you can buy them through some other places. I think Rockler sells them, maybe Woodcraft. But yeah, I don't know if you can see them, if they carry them in stock, I don't know. Uh, you can see them right up here after the, after the class is over. If you want to take a look at them, um, we can certainly show you that. But so, so they got them, yeah. So it's, there's, there's some places, it's probably not going to be real plentiful around, but yeah, there are some, you might be able to look at the Woodsmith store, but you can come right here and save yourself a trip out there if you want. Or if you just like us, you want to go to the store, yeah, that's a great place to go. Yes, sir. Uh, it was about a year ago. I, I'm trying to remember my issue here in your numbers. Um, I want to say it was probably around March to July of last year, somewhere 2016, somewhere in that time frame. Um, I can't remember exactly, but it's somewhere in there. It's, some of this stuff runs together in my mind, but it's been, I know it's been about a year because I've held on to all these since that, knowing that I wanted to teach this class here at Wood Weekend with Wood. So these were left from that test. So if somebody says, what do you do with all the router lifts that are left over? Well, I hold on to them, I hoard them, and then bring them out, you know, for these events like this. <laughs> so, seems like a waste, huh? <laughs> they're, they're my, so, so we'll, so we'll get, we'll get rid of them. Yes, sir. Now you're talking about the, these, these insert rings. Okay, yes. So these, yeah, these are the insert rings that come with most of these routers that you can get to close up the opening around the bit, which is very helpful. So that, you know, if, for example, if you were using a quarter inch bit and you had the, the, you didn't have one in there and you had the full three and a half or whatever inch opening, you're going you're gonna to have a lot more opportunity for stuff to fall in there and get, get caught or stuck. So you use these to close up. And yes, the, most of them come with a spanner wrench like this that just fits in there and then you turn and they twist lock into the openings. They're really handy to get in and out. And... Uh, a lot of these come with one or two of these. You can also buy extras. Um, I find that it's just it's really helpful to have several of them. There's some that are also made for to accept a guide bushing, the, the Porter Cable style guide bushing you can get in there. That's what has that little recessed lip you can put in there, which is not, you know, you don't use it a lot, but if you were using, say, uh, a, like uh, Lee, Lee Jigs makes a dovetail jig that, that would work on a router table, and you can use it, but you have to have a guide bushing, you have, and you have to use their specific guide bushing, but it will fit in there so that you put that on and then you can just go along. So think of how you would route dovetails with a router, only just flip it upside down, put the router in the table, and you can use your dovetail jig on top of the table. But yeah, these, these are a nice little thing to get, and they are specific sometimes to each of them. So I don't know that necessarily, I haven't really checked to see if the Craig rings will fit in the Jessim or the Woodpeckers or some of that. That's a little bit different. The Rockler, again, just, just to be odd, I think they just want to be different. They have theirs where they put them in with three screws, just like you were saying so that they're mounted in there so they don't twist out. You have to each time take these tiny little screws out and they're about a quarter of an inch long, tiny little screws. So it's easy to get lost in all the chips and debris that fall around your feet. So we've been after them for years to, to make this some kind of a twist lock or something so we can get rid of those screws and not have to do that. I think they have a secret aftermarket thing on those screws that they can, they can really make money on. They, this must be really, really, really lucrative. But no, I like the folks at Rockler. They're good people. I just tease them about that. But that is something we would like to see to get, because with this, you have to take this ring out to change the bits on almost every situation. Some of these you wouldn't have to necessarily. Um, if you had this larger opening, you could get the, the collet up maybe and be able to, might be able to change bits on this one without taking the ring out. It's not that big a deal to take it out, so I always just take mine out anyway. But yeah, that is easier to do. But those are nice to have, those little rings to be able to, to close it up and get that, not only it helps your dust collection, but it just keeps you safer, gets you closed up around that bit. With the lifts, most of these have the same amount of vertical travel. They, they'll all have about two to two and a half inches of vertical travel to get you, and that'll get most times, most cases will work for most bits you've got and get you up to where you can change the, the collets. The bench dog down there has uh, three inch, a little over three inches, so it's got a lot of nice, um, nice height there that you can get out of that. So that's really handy if you're, if you're trying to change you know, bits or whatever, just get them up above there. But most of them will have what you need. If you were doing something really like a tall um, crown molding bit or some, some of those that are four inches tall, that's really <laughs> a, a quite a bit to ask. So you, it's really nice to be able to bury that down as much as you can in the, in the, in the, uh, um, in the base when you're trying to cut that if you, don't, if you don't need to use the whole profile or one of those big multi-profile bits that 
everybody buys and thinks is a great idea and then nobody ever uses, those are, those are really good to get those things buried. Uh, anybody use those, by the way? <laughs> nobody ever does. Yeah, so we, we, they always say that's a multi-profile and uh, it probably is. <laughs> we just never find out. Okay, I guess I've covered most of the things here with that. Uh, the, the only one thing that I would like to talk more really, I guess, about is the routers themselves have, when you raise these up to change bits, if you can do it, to do it above the table, uh, we prefer the kind that have two wrench, that use two wrenches, one to hold the, the spindle and one to hold the collet nut and be able to scissor those, you know, get those off with two. It's a lot easier to do that. If you have the kind that have a spindle lock, and let's just see, pick on somebody here that's got one. Porter Cable does. So with Porter Cable, you have a spindle lock that engages, there's a hole in the spindle, and then you use one wrench to remove the collet nut. The problem is when you run into some of this is when you bring that up and you get that right up in here into such an area, sometimes it's hard to get your finger or your thumb down in there to engage that, that spindle lock. Uh, with some of these, I know we had a lot of problems with some of these routers in the lifts trying to get them to do that. We had to use a screwdriver to actually engage the, the spindle lock. So that's a, a difficult thing, and they don't always include a second wrench, although you could in this case, you could use a second wrench if you had one. So you might buy a second wrench or just use one of you if you can find a wrench that'll fit that. It's a lot easier to remove with two wrenches. So that's one of the reasons why we sometimes will talk about two wrench versus the, cut, the, the spindle lock mechanism. It's a lot easier to do. Yes. So, yeah, we try to not alter the tools too much here at the magazine. We, we certainly don't want to publish things saying, yeah, you need to alter this tool in this way to make it do it. We might, we might say something like, we wish they would do this, but we wouldn't actually alter them and, and do that. We could run into some trouble that way, I think, with people. Um, so with the routers lift, lifts and everything covered out of the way, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the router jigs that I like or that, that use a lot that are pretty handy. Talked a little bit earlier about raised panel doors. Everybody know what a raised panel door is? This, this is the raised panel. So it's just a center panel that has that raised kind of profile in the middle. And then you put your rail. Rails are the horizontal piece, styles are the vertical. And then you have a cope and stick joint that goes together like that. That's the, this is the cope and stick fit. They call them rail and style bits a lot, but there's a lot of other rail and style bits that don't cut a cope and stick joint. So it's kind of a misnomer sometimes, but that's what we do. So to, in order to do that, you cut this. This takes a three-bit setup to make these kind of doors. This is a set that I've got from MLCS. So you get cope and stick bits. And the, since they look similar, I have to always remember, I wrote on them, one's got an S and one's got a C. So my stick bit will cut this side profile, the edge profile. So it's made, let's see if I can get this right. So it's in the router table like this. Are you seeing this okay, Paul? So that when you come along and it cuts in, in, a, in a pass, this, it's got the, in this case, the OG profile for the, what would be the top of the rail, and then it's got a slot cutter to cut the slot for the, for the raised panel. And it does those as, as a, in one pass, it can do that. I don't mean literally that you make the whole thing in one pass, but it can do that. I, I, advise you to move your fence forward and take it in incremental passes, but make that cut so it makes a perfect rail, or a perfect, uh, the, that, this is the stick part of the fit. So you use those, you make, you cut your rails and styles with the same, so the inner profile of all the panel, or all this, all these rails and styles have that bit. So if you have, say you have a center rail in a, in a four, in a, just a single panel door, you'd have two rails and two two styles. If you have maybe multiples, you have a two panel door, then you're going to have a middle rail. And in that case, you would cut the stick profile on both edges. So you, in this case, I don't. So I'm just going to, I just did one edges. So you do both of those. Then you come back with the cope bit and it's, it's made, they're made as a matched set. So when you put it in your router, it'll come in and cut the exact same profile then to mate with the stick cut you just made and it'll do that on the end grain of your rails. So it fits just like that. So it cuts the, 
basically the inverse profile and then the tongue to fit into the slot to, so it's a perfect fit. And in order to do that, you have to cut these this way. So you're cutting them basically perpendicular to the fence. And that's, with that narrow rail, you can't just do that free-handed. You're going to run into all kinds of problems. You're going to get hurt or you're going to tear up your boards. It's going to, going to be a mess. So the way you do that is with a coping sled. And a coping sled is simply just any kind of, there's a number of these on the market. This happens to be an MLCS model. Uh, it's just a th simple thing where you put your, your rails in between this, put the, the sled up against the fence, put your rail in there, push it against the fence, lock your clamp in place, that'll hold the rail, and then you just pass it across the bit, which you've set, you've set the fence to the, the right height, you know, to the right distance from the fence, and then it makes that end grain cut so that it's perfectly flat and smooth and it'll, and it'll fit into your rail. But trying to hold that with anything, even, even just a loose backer board, it's really too much to try to move it around because there's a lot of torque on end grain. So you really want to get something that's got that clamped in. You can buy a jig like this. There's plans on um, we, Wood Magazine. We've made a couple of uh, coping sleds over the years. So if you look back through the search history on your flash drive, you can find coping sleds. Um, so you can make your own. Simple, real simple thing to do, but to make that end grain cut, you do need something to hold that, that bit really, or this, this pro rail really securely. So with that said, then you take your third bit, you get a panel razor, and that then makes the panel, in this case here, it cuts the, the profile, the OG again, and then it's got a, a back cutter, we call that, and what that does is it cuts the profile on the bottom side, and then it cuts the back cutter, makes, again, a nice little tenon that fits into the stick groove, into that slot that we cut earlier. It makes it fit exactly the same. Some of these have adjustable, uh, where you can add spacers in there to, to make that, this, this tenon basically a little thicker if you need to or thinner. So you can take that in or, in or out. And, but this one's made perfect fit. So then you just do this all the way around. And with something like this, of course, take that in incremental cuts. Don't try to make this in one heavy pass because this will really tear it up. And, um, and then always, when you're routing these, always do ingrain first and start on an ingrain and then just work your way around so that any tear out you've got here will always be taken care of by your next pass down there. So ingrain, edge, ingrain, edge. Always do it route in that order. And always leave your panels, in case you do not, leave them, leave them short so they don't, so you've got room to expand inside of your rails and styles. You don't want to have that split and blow it out and break your joint open. So that's a, basically one of the jigs that's really critical to making rails and styles, making raised panel doors. Uh, this set has some other bits in there for cabinet making, but you can buy those as three-piece bit sets. Uh, you, you, the, the, the cope and stick bits come as a match set, so you always buy those together. I showed this earlier, dovetail box. I made this on my router table. It's a uh, one and one eighth space through dovetail, eight degrees, made with a Keller dovetail jig. Anybody here familiar with the Keller jig? It's been around for 35, 40 years probably. Um, it's just a simple, when you buy this, you get this phenolic template. Uh, they also sell them in aluminum. I got the phenolic. And then it just tells you the instructions of how to mount it to a block of wood so that you get the, per you got it, there's a little bit of spacing. You do some cutting and fitting. And once you get it set, you never have to adjust it again so that when you do this, Use bearing guided bits in your router table, clamp your wood vertically on here, and then you just follow the, you just go in and out like that, cut your rails and your tails and your, and your uh, pins with that, cut tails on one side, pins on the other, using a straight bit and a dovetail bit, and it's, it's just almost a flawless system. I, I did a video on this uh, once, it's on woodmagazine.com, it was called 12 minute video, or 12 minute dovetail. <laughs> it was a video of that. 12-minute dovetails, so I cut a, a four-sided box with these in 12 minutes, changing out the bits and everything included. It's such a quick, intuitive uh, way to do that. Yes, sir? Keller, like it's K-E-L-L-E-R. That's the name of the, the dovetail jig. That, that This just happens to be one of a few that does the same thing. There's, there's another one called the Katie jig, just like the woman's name, Katie. Uh, that's a, another one. It has the ability to have adjustable fingers. That's an advantage it has versus this one. This one's a fixed template. And then I mentioned the lead jig earlier. They have one that works on a router table as well. So you can do, you can do half blinds and throughs. This one will only do through dovetails and box joints. The lead jig will do th those two plus the half blind. 
uh, because it has a slot through the center when you're cutting those half blinds you have to be able to cut one horizontally and one vertically and you do them both at the same time and that lead jig it's it's I can't remember the model number but you could find it on their on their website it's a really really cool thing to be able to so if you do drawer joints you can do those on the router table I find that a lot easier than doing them by hand because when you're when you're doing routers in it with a router dovetails with a jig in a in a vise or something you're, you're mostly working in the blind you can't really you don't want to get down underneath and watch the bit and so you're just kind of going by feel as you kind of feel those where the if it's working on a guide bushing or a bearing guide a bit either one you're just kind of feeling your way along those fingers i like being able to see what i'm doing this is one of my favorite bits or favorite dovetail jigs um, and i don't remember what this sells for I know it's a couple hundred bucks maybe or something like that but it's well worth it if you'd like to make dovetails You can make box joints uh, on, on a table saw, but again, like I said earlier, I like to make mine on the router table just because I just feel safer on there and it just makes it just more comfortable for me. So I can use this, uh, make these on a router table with a jig that I got from Rockler. It's a real simple jig that works easily with a, you use a, a spiral bit. It comes with, when you buy this kit, it comes set up to do quarter, three eighths and half inch uh, box joints but does not include the bit. So you have to supply your own bit or buy one of theirs, but it gives you the spacer. This blue strip is the spacer bar that sets that, so it gives you the right spacing. And the way that works is you just put your, you put chuck your bit in the router, fix that, set this down over the bit, lock it in place, and then that won't move, the jig won't move. Then you just use your, the sliding carriage, fits down in there, hold your board, which I'd be, normally I would be standing back with my back to you to do this, but I'm going to show you. So you hold your board here, and then you just make a pass through standing on end, take your board, lift it up, move it over, set it onto the blue, the blue spacer bar, that joint you just cut, and then make a next pass, and then it's just lift and cut, lift and cut, keep making those, and it's a simple, simple way to do that. This kit sells for maybe 75 bucks, I want to say, something like that. Um, nice little kit to, to be able to do that. This is Rockler. You can find it on Rockler's website or in their catalogs. We did a, a, a similar kind of a jig, uh, Winwood Magazine. Again, it'll be on, the plans for that are on there. Ours, rather than, than registering in the miter slot, I think registered off the end of the table or off the, the front edge of the table, something like that. But it worked in a similar fashion. I don't remember the exact things, but that's on your flash drive with the, with the back issue history. So just, just kind of search box joints and you'll find that. But that's a real easy thing. And then it, uh, just as an aside, Rockler has clamping calls that go with box joints that are really handy. So if you're clamping them with a, with a, um, a web clamp or a, a strap clamp, they make these plastic calls that match so they have the fingers just in the reverse. So it'll help bring those together because you can't get your clamps right up against those, because you usually leave your fingers proud a little bit. But that, those clamping calls let you be able to pull those up really tight. So I didn't bring those to show you, but those are really handy if you're looking at doing that. And then this is a miter spline box. So it's just a simple box made with miters. First, you just start out making a miter box. Just glue, just glue it together, get it dry, sand it fairly smooth, get the edges back nice, crisp, and clean. And then cut slots to put these miter keys in. And at the risk of sounding like a shill for Rockler, I don't work for them. I don't get any money from them. So I just, I just like, they make a lot of really nice jigs. So. It's just unfortunate. I guess it, I just happen to have a couple here, but they're really good jigs. This one works similar in that you put this carriage down over your bit. So put a dovetail bit in there if you want. You can also use a straight bit, a spiral bit, anything you want to be able to make a slot through there to, across the corners. And then this carriage rides back and forth on there, and it's just a simple thing. just holds it again at a 45-degree angle. You put your box or whatever it is in there, a picture frame, anything, and then you can adjust these. You can adjust these side to side to, theoretically, maybe you can adjust this one, but you can slide them to fit your, to get your box snug. Put it down in the, the holder. So set your box down here. Here, let me get another one. I've got one that's got the grooves already cut. So you put your box in there, slide it forward over the bit, make the cut, and then just keep rotating the box without moving that fence. And that way you get all four sides at the same distance from your top edge. And then if you want to do it so that it's mirror image on the other, you just turn it around, 
put the bottom edge against there, do the same thing, and then you've got these just to make a one pass because with a dovetail bit you get one chance. You can't you can't make that in multiple passes. It's just it's got to be that one height. If you try to do that, you're not going to get a perfect fit. So get those slots cut in your miter box. Take this jig off then. Leave the bit in the router table. Just whatever dovetail bit. It works with any, any degree dovetail bit. It doesn't have to be any certain degree. So whatever it is you've got in there, I think this was a 14 degree. So then, I'm sorry? But you have to have the box built. Yes. Yes, you have to, you have, to have your, your mitered box already glued together. And as you know, a miter, just a mitered box in itself is, is not really strong. And the purpose of the, the splines is to help strengthen it and add some, add some contrast, yeah, some a little, little pizzazz to it. So get your, yeah, get your box done, cut the slots, then leave your bit in there, set it the same height, and then just, just get a piece of stock that whatever you want to use for your splines to whatever thickness. This was about, I think, 5 eighths, something like that. Bring your fence up to the bit. this thing. I got this edge out here. So bring your fence up there to it, to about the center. Make a pass until you get the, to where the, the bit is cutting a perfect, so I would cut this side first, to where you get the, the bottom edge where it makes a perfect cut and it doesn't have a little lip down at the bottom of the dovetail. So you get that side cut, then you flip the board over and then you start, you make the same cut on the other side and test and just keep nibbling away. You might have to make a little bit deeper cut, so keep moving your fence as needed until it fits perfectly in the slots that you cut. Thankfully, this still fits because I made these a couple of weeks ago. So you just do that in there until it fits good. Then you go to the table saw and rip this dovetail spline off of the blank and then just cut them in short pieces, glue them into the box, cut them off and sand them flush. So just a simple little thing. You can just make, make a lot of this stock the same. And if you know you're going to use that same bit again, you can, you can make up some of this. And it, it's always going to fit, hopefully. Um, but a simple little way to do that. Unless, unless something happens, sometimes shrinking and swelling with the se seasonal changes will, will affect that. But then that just gives you a nice little uh, look to, so it strengthens that miter joint and gives a little bit, little bit more uh, a nice look to it. So. Those are a couple of my favorite jigs there. Okay, and then uh, I want to talk a little bit about the INCRA table because this one's really different than the others. I don't know, are you seeing all this okay, Paul? Yeah. Okay. So are you guys familiar with the INCRA system? Anyone here? Anyone own one by chance? Okay, okay, we got a couple. Table saw, yeah, okay. So the INCRA system is a little bit different than all the other router tables. It is a router table, but it's got the key to the INCRA system is really the fence. And this is a, a really unique kind of a, a system in that with all of these, you, you just set the fence to whatever you want, uh, your bit and all this. This one, the fence is, is got an incremental positioning system. So it's, it's able to, you're able to move this fence in as fine a, as one, thou, one, one thousandth of an inch. So you can move this with a micro adjuster so that this fence slides back and forth from a fixed position so your table is longer this way, and your, and your fence sets this, so you can move it back and forth to fit. And then by this incremental positioning, you can do, cut all kinds of intricate joinery, thanks to their, the math that they've already done for you. And it also can work as a regular router table. So if you, you can put these auxiliary faces on there, and then you can, they can move side to side just like any other router fence. So you could do roundovers and chamfers and whatever, and you can, you can do anything, if you, so if you're not cutting joinery necessarily using their templates in their system, you can just use it as a regular router fence. But if you want to do something like, I don't know if you can see anywhere on here, they cut, um, you can do what they call double dovetails, double box joints, which are basically an, an inlaid joint. So it's a, a double dovetail is a, a, a dovetail joint that's been cut and glued together twice so that you can get a little inlay look. And the same with the box joint. You're just cutting and assembling it twice. And this manual, really, it's really good that it'll show you all how to do that. It comes with these templates that work. You put those into the fence. The templates here that are maybe a little hard to see from there. But it, it's all set up, and it tells you which template to use for which joint. And, and all you do then is just move the fence to each one of these markings as indicated in the book, and, it, and you just can't miss on it. Um, so it tells you some of the joints here you can do dovetails, box joints, 
different sizing, different spacing. It tells you everything you need to know from the workpiece thickness, the size of the bit, the height of the bit, the, the, the spacing that you want between them, and it tells you all that. And then it even tells, let's see here, where am I at? With double dovetails, then it shows you how to do that, the system, and it tells you. And you can do all this with, with one bit in those cases. So you have one dovetail bit can make this whole joint. Um, this was set up with a 14 degree dovetail bit. And unfortunately, I didn't bring a box in. Last year, I taught this class here of how to make double dovetails. And I made, I don't know what, Lucas, 25 boxes or something like that. And I forgot to bring one in. So I've got a bunch of them stashed around places here. But you, with this, when you, when you buy the fence system, you get the manual and all these templates that come with it. So it, it is part of the system. But then you start adding all the other stuff, kind of a la carte or whatever. So if you can buy the top. You can buy the fence and the top. You, can, you could just buy the fence system and then make your own cabinet and all that. Same with, same with all these others. You can add that down to it. Or you can buy their, their system as well, from, from the stand to the, uh, the dust collection housing. You can buy their lift, which their, their lift, which says INCRA on it, is actually the Jessim Master Lift that says INCRA. So the only difference between it, it was private labeled for, for them by Jessim. So it's made. The, it's exactly the same as that one over there, the, the, jet, the master lift. The only difference is that it has INCRA engraved on there and that it has these metallic insert plates to go around the bits. And then it has magnets in the, in, the, in the thing to hold those down. The only difference being here is that you get dust collection by going, the dust falls through these slots and then that housing around the router bit sucks it out. It's unbelievable dust collection. So that's the only real difference for that. You know, so if somebody says, oh, I'd rather have the INCRA lift than the JSM, well, they're the same, they're the same lift. Just the, the difference here is right, right on this. But they're, you can certainly get either one of these. And I've got to remember which way that goes in here. There it goes. I have to put that back. Um, that only fits a certain way there. <laughs> it's close enough for now. But this one works really well. This is a, it's a pricey kit to get into. And again, I don't work for Incra. I don't get any royalties if they sell any. I just tell, again, as a tool tester, this is just a system that really wowed me with, with what it's capable of doing. And it looks intimidating, but it's actually pretty easy once you get into it. Uh, I, I was just curious of how it would work, and I wanted to do, learn to do it. And I contacted the guys from Incra. They came up here and, and spent, I don't know, half a day training. And by the end of the day, I was doing this by myself and making them. So they just, it's, it's such a simple system to really use because they've done all the math for you. It's just a way to do it. And then if you just want to make it as a router table, it does all that too. So if you're just looking for a router table and you don't want to do some of their intricate joinery, then, then this is overkill. You don't need to buy that. You can buy any of these router tables for that. This one is just really good for also being able to do that. You know, now if you're going to, when are you going to do an inlaid dovetail or a double dovetail? It's going to be for something that you want to show off, a, a jewelry box or some kind of a fancy, you know, thing like that. You won't do your drawers like that because <laughs> who wants to open up a drawer and see that? I mean, it's just, it's not a necessary thing. So um, really you would only buy this system if you really want to get into that, I believe. This fence also works with the table saw. This gentleman said he's got one on there. You can use the same kind of a fence setup that works that way. Um, I've not used it on a table saw, but I know it does work in, in the past. I know other editors that would have tried that, and you can buy that. It's certainly, certainly good. So um, it's a nice setup. But yeah, as you see it here with the, with the whole system and the router motor, you're looking at about $1,300 in this. So it's quite a, quite a bit to, to invest in that. Um, by the same token, if you buy the, if you buy the top end system from Jessim and Woodpeckers, you're looking at about the same money, about $1,200 to buy their full kit systems, they're, they're in that same uh, ballpark. And I don't remember off the top of my head what the, the bench dog uh, system is, but it's, it's a little, it's high up there too, to do that. Anybody, any, any questions or comments on any of this? Yes? The, the underneath, that's a dust collection housing? Yeah, the red box. Yeah, that's a dust collection housing. That's an, access, an optional accessory that comes as part of, you can buy that extra. I don't remember what the price of it, but it's, it's part of the system. Uh, you can get it included or you can buy that optionally. So you could buy that just, just by itself right now and put it on probably any of these. I don't, I don't really know how it attaches, but I'll bet you could figure out a way to put it on one of these and attach it. And then it has a four inch dust port at the bottom to be able to hook on and get your dust collection out of there. It really, really works well because 
to be able to get the, the, the level of suction and capacity of a four inch dust collector out of there is really nice. And it, just, it does a remarkable job of getting the dust out of there. So, um, but yeah, that is an optional piece. I want to say it's maybe 50 to 75 bucks for that housing, something like that. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess we haven't really done that review per se, but I've used a lot of these and, and just, you know, kind of anecdotally using a lot of them and not really putting hardcore testing through each one of them. But if I were to go out and buy one right now, I would, I would buy the Jessim Master Lift, I would buy this Jessim Top and Fence, and I would buy the Craig Stand and, and put that together and put those because I like the adjust, I want to be able to adjust that height up to my level of working. I, the, there's nothing wrong with the Jessim Stand other than it just can't adjust to that, but Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Right, that's correct. Yes. So if I were spending your money, I would go out and... <laughs> we're going to bankroll this. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I would buy this. I, I really like this system. Um, and it, it's really, really nice. Um, if, I, if I could do that. Second, you know, choice would probably be one of these other two here. I, these, these are the three, I guess, in my favorites of my use of doing them. I would, I would do this. Um, but, you know, you can save a lot of money by building your own cabinet and then buying the top and, and the fence and putting it on there. Uh, just in my experience, the phenolic is probably the best of the tops because it's lightweight, and it, but yet it's sturdy and rigid and it won't sag. It's easy to work with. It's got the slick finish so that your, your boards glide across it easily. Um, it's, just, it's just a nice, nice top altogether, and I would probably buy the phenolic. Um, so... This is the Jessim, and you're welcome to come up afterward and look at them if you'd like. And I'll yes, this one has, uh, in fact, all these here have two-piece fences with that, yes, because they all have the split fence. It, it's the ones that really don't get into, are, are more the kind that are like shaper-type fences. Those are really the ones that, that are a little harder to use, but yes, all these have the split fences. So, any other questions? Nothing more. Okay, well, we'll get out early. I guess if there's any refreshments, you're welcome to go down and take a look. Uh, the, the charity build starts, I believe they said at 4.30, wasn't it? So we've got about 45 minutes maybe to do that, so hang out. Um, if anybody wants to talk, I'll stick around.